So we'll be welcoming Dorothy now. She is a uh, our candidate from Washington's third uh, congressional district. She served in our military and is a veteran in a war that continues today. And you will hear how her feelings on that. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dorothy. Thank you for having me. Uh, please tell us what inspired you to run for office. Well, I it's been um, looking at how the leadership of this country has failed us for an entire generation that has prompted me to finally stand up and say, well, if nobody else is gonna do it, then I'm going to. I deployed to Iraq in 2005, my son was three. He was an infant when we went to war in Afghanistan. He is now looking at turning 17 in a few months and we are still at war. And looking at that, seeing that we have a war that is lasting an entire generation. This is the longest war in American history. It should be the number one topic. It should be the thing that Congress is focused on. How do we get out of this? How do we end war? Because it is their job. It is Congress's job to declare war and peace. And they have been abdicating that to the executive branch since the Korean War. And that is why we keep getting dragged into these wars with no strategic purpose that we cannot clearly define what mission success is. And we're sacrificing lives and we're hurting people in other countries without any gain for our own personal security. I ask people a lot when I'm out on the campaign trail, do you feel safer? And I never get a yes. So after nearly 17 years, if we're not answering yes, we're doing something wrong. Absolutely. Um, and tell us a little bit about your district and what the issues are in your district. So the third congressional district is most of Southwest Washington. It goes from Klickitat County in the gorge out to Pacific County in the coast uh, and up to Lewis County is our northernmost border. And it's a mix of urban and rural mostly rural uh, and so the biggest issues here are economic issues okay and we have some we have some issues with uh, climate change with our forest lands and ocean acidification affecting the shellfish industry but in large part it's affordable housing it's a lack of living wage jobs it's a lack of employers our tax structure in this state uh, makes it difficult for business, small businesses to survive because it's very upside down. And we do a lot of tax giveaways for big corporations, but we're not thinking about uh, the smaller companies. So it's hard for companies to stay here and function. A lot of people all the way drive up to like 45 minutes or 45 miles to commute to Oregon to work. And we have major gridlock people are staying and sitting in traffic for hours a day in order to get across this river over two bridges that's what we have two bridges to cross the river one of them was built a hundred years ago oh it, <laughs> but, yeah. do you do you feel safe <laughs> no no it is not it is not a safe bridge it is too narrow for the traffic that it handles and it's being held up by wood pilings it is not uh, it was built for carriage traffic and livestock traffic and originally oh my well good news maybe after all this time the wood has been petrified <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so the bridge is also a really big issue uh, it's a big focus for the people who live in vancouver and clark county it's because they have to cross it every day and is this the bridge that connects Washington to Oregon? Yes. And so it's not just something a Washington decision can impact. It is more of a national or yes, interstate if, issue? The, the federal government should have stepped in a long time ago, but this is probably the case across the country. There's a lot of federal infrastructure projects that have not been dealt with. And that's, we need massive infrastructure investment, about $4.6 trillion nationwide. Well, that's a job builder. <laughs> well, thank you. And 
So what are the main issues that you're focusing on with your campaign? Campaign finance reform, because all of those issues are affected by the fact that corporations have more influence over our politicians than we do as voters. Absolutely. And as long as that is the case, as long as the donor class is more important than the people, we're not going to get any change. We're not going to get any of these problems solved. The reason that our leadership continues to fail is because they're not serving us. They're serving the donor class. Absolutely. And you mentioned ending war. Uh, that's another of your hot spots. Yes, absolutely. But again, campaign finance reform, as long as the defense industry and the oil oligarchy has that influence, we're going to continue to fight wars over resources and we're going to continue to use our military to do it. Absolutely. And, and then are there any other re uh, issues that are also co complicated by finances? <laughs> Well, all of them. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Yeah. So healthcare would be another big one that is important to people. Um, we, we are stuck with these middleman insurance companies that are just robbing profit from the system. Their incentive is not to provide healthcare. Their incentive is to pay the least amount of money they can in order to profit. And so they're they're taking a lot of money out of the system, making the system more expensive than it needs to be, but they have lots of lobbyists. And the pharmaceutical industry also has lots of lobbyists and lots of lobby money. And every time, all those investments pay off for them. They get to keep these massive profits at the, at the expense of the people. Absolutely. And then you mentioned economic security as one of the issues in your district. Do you have any uh, solutions to offer for economic security? Yeah, well, yes, we need a living wage. And um, by the time we implement $15 an hour, it won't be enough. Yeah. We need to start talking about a higher wage than $15 an hour. Here in Vancouver, it's twenty one fifty. That's is a, living a living wage? wage. Is a living wage. And the median wage is somewhere around $13 an hour. Wow. So even in Vancouver, it's $21. And that's a smaller town or city in Washington. So if you go to, there's maybe only two other larger cities. <laughs> but when you go there, it, the economic needs and demands are just exponentially greater. I, I would like to see maybe a living wage connected to the medium, the median cost of housing. <laughs> yes. Well, living wage. I mean, and living wage should be tied to the cost of cost of living increases. It should be going up annually without needing the Congress to keep changing the laws and passing it. It should just be tied to cost of living. And then we've got infrastructure investment. We've got this bridge that's 100 years old. We've got, we've got water infrastructure that needs to be repaired. We've got roads that need to be repaired. We've got potholes that are years old <laughs> that aren't being seen to. So we can do massive infrastructure investments. We can provide grants to cities and local townships to provide to help with these public work projects that they don't have the funding to take care of. And we have a lot of forest land, so we have a lot of national park land here in the district. And part of what we can do is bring back the Conservation Corps and put people to work cutting cutting new trails because our trails are overrun like we we have traffic on the trails now you want to go on a nice day and go hiking you're gonna run into a bunch of people and so mm -hmm. we can we can go out cut some more trails put people to work and just expand how much economic growth there is just by doing those things because infrastructure investments repairing infrastructure let's lay high speed you know, broadband service to the rural areas, then tech company, companies can set up there and take advantage of lower rent prices. Uh, people can work from home. There's lots of jobs now that people can do without ever having to go into an office, but they need, they need high speed internet service to do that. So there's lots and lots and lots of things we can be doing to increase economic security. And it's not just in my district. This is a national problem.
Absolutely. Well, thank you for uh, being stepping up to share share to share the message and improve the nation. And then, uh, so you speak. You were speaking of environmental stuff, uh, the acidification of the ocean and your forests. Now you are bordering both the Pacific Ocean and the Columbia River, correct? Yes. And so uh, we've been. I'm in Tacoma, we're fighting an LNG uh, uh, facility at our port. Now, uh, correct that uh, your area has defeated a an oil terminal? Yes, so there was a proposed oil terminal at the Vancouver port and it has been a long and drawn out battle, um, but the governor finally made the final call to deny the permits and so we we are celebrating. We're celebrating not turning Vancouver into an oil town. Fantastic. How, do, do they want to be a coal or methanol town? <laughs> well, not not Vancouver, but <laughs> unfortunately, we there's a coal terminal proposal in Longview, and there's the methanol plant in Kalama, and these are. And it's a hard issue because pits environmentalists against labor and it's pitting labor against labor and it's causing a lot of strife that's unnecessary because there's such a shortage of jobs particularly in Cowlitz County where both of these projects are being proposed there there aren't a lot of employers and so you can see why people are willing to ex to fight on the side of the fossil fuel infrastructure because they're desperate and they need work, but we don't need to make this about that. We can say, you know what? We do understand that they need work, which is why we need infrastructure investment, which is why we need to be investing in green energy and investing in green jobs and then investing in infrastructure. like. You take plumbers and pipe fitters. They're the ones who really, they rely on these pipelines, like your natural gas pipeline, uh, your oil pipelines that like uh, Dapple and Keystone, they really don't have a lot of opportunities outside of these, of these things because we're not, we're not repairing water infrastructure. We're not replacing water mains that typically only last 75 years, but have been in the ground for a hundred. There's so, plenty of work we can give these people and there are plenty of things we can be doing if we work together and fight for them. Excellent. So we need to invite the labor people to uh, acknowledge the environmental impact of the industry they're attempting to support and redirect them to demanding infrastructure that's uh, yeah community supporting like <laughs> but i would i would reverse that because i oh. think that labor actually understands the environmental impact i would say it's the environmentalists who need to listen to labor okay. and fight for them that you just gave me goosebumps you just reset my brain thank you that was, that was brilliant so fantastic and then um so in your campaign uh you've had some endorsements, and I only noted a few of them here on the slide, but uh, you, you're you with Justice Democrats? Yes. And brand new Congress? Yep. And you've had at least two Our Revolution endorsements? Yes. And I think we have four. Oh, fantastic. And then you have at least two Washington Democratic Caucus endorsements? Yes. And that's the mil veterans and families? Veterans Mil and military families. There you go. And then, um, and the Progressive Caucus, correct? Yes. That's exciting. And, and I did notice there were a slew of others, and some of them were even in Oregon. So you're, you're, you're crossing <laughs> boundaries already, breaking, <laughs> breaking the boundary, state boundary. Yeah. <laughs> we live in the, we live in, the, so Vancouver is this very, unique situation that we are actually part of the Portland metro area. So the Portland metropolitan area is the, the 
largest metropolitan area to cross two states. And so we, um, we have a tendency to be affected by what happens in Portland when we don't tend to have a voice about what happens in Portland. And so I think making those connections with a lot of the progressive organizations that we share this river with as a border uh, will kind of help us to make sure that our, our interests are also being seen. Excellent. Well, I think it's wonderful. It seems reasonable to reach out to Portland. I think they're kind of acknowledged as being pretty progressive. <laughs> so <laughs> you get all those progressive Portland people to come in and help talk to people in Southwest Washington and spread the message. I think that's a pretty solid game plan. And then uh, how can Washingtonians help you? or anybody in the nation. Anybody, anybody this show in... is geared towards Washington, <laughs> but I, I, I hear there's some people even outside of our continent watching. Yes. So we always need volunteers and we do have remote volunteer opportunities. So you go to DorothyForCongress.com. Uh, you can fill out a volunteer form. Um, we also, more than anything, we need those small dollar donations and we need people to become monthly sustaining donors that really helps us ensure that we can cover operation costs. Uh, it's going to, it costs us about $10,150 a month would be what it would cost us for three full-time staffers, a office space and our compliancy software. Um, so our treasurer can file with all those small dollar donors because it's, it's pretty intensive when you're looking at 1,600 people. And so oh the, more, yeah. the more we can get of those monthly donors, and even if it's just a dollar a month, it, it helps. It really helps. And so just going to DorothyForCongress.com, click the Contribute button. We make it pretty easy for you. There you go. Uh, just fill out what you can afford and... Perfect. You know. Yeah, I feel like that if you've got five dollars to donate each month, give a dollar to Dorothy, give a dollar to Uphill Media, and then pick three other awesome progressives to donate to, or all to Dorothy. <laughs> That's okay too. <laughs> yeah. so, but I agree; those recurring donations are va vitally important uh, because it allows you to plan your your expenses or how much you need to compensate or how much you have in excess. That is a, a I like those recurring donations <laughs> hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> Yes, they are so, very valuable. <laughs> is there uh, anything else? Oh, well, before I ask you to wrap up and share anything you'd like uh, or anything we didn't cover, uh, Brian, is, are there any uh, questions? We do. We have one question that was geared towards the beginning from Miss K Smith one two three four. Thank you for the question. Uh, do you know how much tax the top one to ten percent pay in taxes? She's under the impression they had consecutive tax cuts over forty years, but some Republicans claim they pay most taxes in the U.S. We're talking about federal taxes here or state taxes because it's different. I believe that it would be federal. All right. That she's so, asking. So federally, um, I think they pay about 73%, I think, around there right now. I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's in the 70s. Um, but they're getting about 90% of the wealth in the, in the nation. Um, they also, here's the thing about why people who benefit the most should pay the most. They cannot gain that wealth. They are not able to have that economic growth and that wealth come in without our transportation systems, without our security, with, you know, without our military securing them, without our police forces securing them, without, without our education system providing them with educated people to work for them. So it makes sense that they would pay more. Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else, Brian? Nope. You clarified it perfectly clear, and it was federal that she was asking for. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Kate. It was Kate, correct? 
One, two, three, four. Yep, Miss K. Smith. Oh, Miss K. Smith. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody else in the chat. I'm I'm enjoying this. So, excellent. Keep going. Yeah, and keep keep Brian popular. entertained. You, I don't want him to get bored before his segment. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so Dorothy, what? How would you like to close this out? What would you like us to know? What would you like us to leave with? I think just leaving with the fact that we we're in this together and that I'm just going to keep asking people to dig deep, to figure out what they can give and what they can do for this movement. We cannot afford to sit on the sidelines. We have too much facing us that if we continue to kick the can down the road, we will see crisis after crisis. We have people living on the streets. In my district, there are more than 4,000 identified homeless children. Oh. These children cannot even think about getting an education, can't even think about what going on in school when they're worried about where they're going to sleep, where their next meal is going to come from. Without that stability, we are doing the next generation a huge disservice. And I, I just want us all to get back to that, to that cultural attitude we had, that it was our job to ensure that the next generation was better off than us, that we should not accept, that we should never accept that the next generation is going to enter into adulthood worse off than their parents. And I heard that in, 90s, in the 90s with Bill Clinton. He ran on that message. He ran on the populist message that the next generation was going to go into adulthood worse off than their parents. And that didn't change anything. So while they carry that message, they're not doing the action. So we need people who will do the action. And that means that we stand up and we fight together because there are more of us than there are of them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dorothy. It's been a pleasure talking to you and we look forward to hearing from you more in the future. Hey, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Dorothyforcongress.com. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. I'll put it in the chat for you too. Have a good one, Dorothy. Thanks for stopping by.